in the dim and solitary confines of the old manor. I found a reluctant sanctuary. The house, inherited from my late mother, stood at the edge of a small, nameless village, a remnant of a forgotten past, where the weight of ancestral secrets hung heavy in the air. My name is Mara Thorne, and in this forsaken place I sought solitude, a refuge from the cacophony of the modern world and the unending grief that consumed my every waking moment. The house itself was a relic of bygone days, its crumbling stones and weathered timbers echoing with the whispers of centuries. Each room, each corridor, seemed to pulse with a life of its own, as though the very walls held memories too dark and ancient for human minds to fathom. The villagers, those few who still remained in this dying settlement, spoke of the house in hushed tones, their eyes averted, as if to do so would invoke some nameless terror. The first few nights passed in a haze of restless sleep and half-remembered dreams, where shadows moved of their own accord, and the wind seemed to carry with it the distant echoes of forgotten voices. It was on the fifth night that I first encountered the visitor, a being that would shatter the fragile boundaries of my sanity and draw me inexorably toward a revelation too dreadful to comprehend. I awoke to the sound of silence a stillness so profound that it seemed to smother the very breath in my lungs. The room was bathed in the pale, sickly light of a waning moon, casting long, grotesque shadows that danced upon the walls. It was then that I saw her, a child no older than eight, standing at the foot of my bed. Her form was ethereal, translucent, as if fashioned from mist and moonlight, and her eyes, those eyes, were dark, empty voids that seemed to pierce the very fabric of my soul. The child stood motionless, her gaze fixed upon me. Yet it was not her eyes that held me in thrall, but her hand, outstretched, pointing silently toward the door. I felt a chill, a coldness that seeped into my bones, as if the very air around her was drained of warmth and light. I tried to speak, to move, but my body refused to obey, paralyzed by a fear that I could not name. For what felt like an eternity, we remained locked in that terrible tableau, the child's silent accusation hanging heavy in the air. I wanted to scream, to flee, to banish this specter from my sight, but I was powerless, a prisoner within my own flesh. The child's gaze never wavered, her finger pointing steadily at the door, as if beckoning me to some unseen fate. As the first light of dawn crept through the curtains, the child faded her form dissolving into the shadows from whence she came. I was left alone, drenched in sweat, my heart pounding with a terror I could not dispel. The memory of those empty eyes haunted me, a silent reminder of the night's encounter, and I knew with a certainty born of madness that this was no mere dream. The following nights brought no respite, for the child returned again and again, each time more insistent, more demanding. Her presence filled me with a dread so profound that I feared I would lose my mind. The villagers, those few who still spoke to me, noticed the change, the gauntness of my face, the wildness in my eyes, but they said nothing, their own fears reflected in their silence. Desperation drove me to search the house, to uncover the secrets that lay hidden within its ancient walls. I scoured every room, every dusty corner, until I stumbled upon a box of old letters, yellowed with age and bound with a faded ribbon. They were my mother's penned in a delicate hand that I remembered from childhood, and they spoke of things I could scarcely believe. The letters told of a child, a girl named Eliza, who had vanished from the house many years ago. My mother wrote of dark rituals and whispered incantations, of a power that had been sought and a price that had been paid, Eliza, it seemed, was the key to this dark mystery, a sacrificial lamb offered to a being beyond the veil of our reality. With each letter, the truth unfolded like a malignant lignant flower, and I felt the tendrils of a cosmic horror entwine themselves around my soul. The child was no mere ghost, but a harbinger, a messenger of a terror that transcended time and space. The doorway had been opened, a gateway to an existence beyond human comprehension, and Eliza's restless spirit was bound to this place, forever pointing the way to her own damnation. 
I could no longer deny the truth, the reality of the horror that had taken root within my home. The child's silent presence was a beacon, a call to something ancient and malevolent that dwelled within the very fabric of the universe. I knew then that my fate was sealed, for there could be no escape from the darkness that awaited me beyond the door. The nights grew longer, the shadows deeper, and I felt the pull of the doorway, a compulsion that gnawed at my mind and soul. I was drawn inexorably toward the child, toward the silent beckoning of her outstretched hand, and I knew that soon I would have to answer her call. For in the end, there are some truths too terrible to be denied, some doors that must remain closed, and some horrors that are best left undisturbed. The nights merged into a blur of waking nightmares, each one more unbearable than the last. The child's presence grew more intense, more palpable, until her visits began to haunt the daylight hours as well. No longer was I confined to seeing her only in the spectral moonlight now. She lingered at the edges of my vision, a fleeting shadow in the corner of a room, a faint whisper in the silence. Her finger, always pointing, guided my every step toward that cursed door. And the door. That ancient, forgotten portal had become the axis of my existence, a nexus around which all my fears revolved. I had discovered it by accident, or perhaps it was fate that had drawn me to it, fate or some darker will. Hidden behind a tapestry in the hallway, its surface was covered in strange symbols, etched deep into the wood, as if carved by some ancient hand. The sight of it filled me with a nameless dread, a primal terror that resonated in the deepest recesses of my mind. Each night the child appeared, her ghostly figure standing before the door, her finger pointing insistently, her dark eyes filled with a mute command. The air around her was thick with an unearthly cold, a chill that seemed to drain the life from the very walls. I felt it in my bones, a creeping paralysis that robbed me of thought and will, leaving me a prisoner in my own home. In my desperate search for answers, I scoured the letters, hoping to find some clue, some explanation for the madness that had overtaken me. My mother's words spoke of rituals, of incantations long forgotten, and of a power that had once been summoned to this place. The villagers, she wrote, had known of the door, had feared it, and had sealed it away, hoping to bury the darkness forever. But darkness, I have learned, cannot be so easily banished. It waits, patient and eternal, for the time when it will be unleashed once more. The more I read, the more I felt the pull of the door, a compulsion that gnawed at my soul. The whispers grew louder, voices that spoke in a language I could not understand, yet which seemed to echo the deepest fears of my heart. I began to see visions, glimpses of a world beyond our own, a realm of shadows and mist, where formless beings writhed in an endless void. In my dreams I walked among them, a specter in a land of darkness, and the child was always there, guiding me, leading me toward the door. It was on the seventh night that the door revealed its true nature. I had been wandering the house, unable to sleep, when I heard the sound, a low, resonant hum, like the tolling of a distant bell. It came from the hallway, from behind the tapestry, and as I approached I felt the air grow thick, heavy with an unseen presence. The door seemed to pulse with a life of its own, its surface glowing faintly as if lit from within. I reached out, my hand trembling, and touched the door. The symbols etched into the wood burned cold beneath my fingers, and a shock ran through me, a jolt of fear and recognition. The whispers rose to a crescendo, a cacophony of voices that filled my mind, and I saw, truly saw, for the first time. The door was not merely a portal, it was a gateway, a bridge between worlds, a link to a place where the very laws of reality held no sway. The child appeared beside me, her form more solid, more real than ever before. Her eyes, those dark voids, met mine, and I understood. She was the key, the guardian, and the prisoner of this place. Bound by a pact forged in blood and darkness, she was trapped between worlds, her spirit eternally tethered to the door. Her silent pointing was not a command, but a plea, a desperate cry for release. 
I stumbled back, the vision fading, the whispers receding to a dull murmur. The house loomed around me, its shadows deeper, its silence more profound. I knew then that I could not escape. The door had claimed me, as it had claimed Eliza and all who had come before. The entity, the being that dwelled beyond, had set its gaze upon me, and there could be no turning back. In the days that followed, the line between reality and nightmare blurred. I saw the child in every reflection, heard her whispers in every breath of wind. The house seemed to close in around me, its walls narrowing, its halls lengthening, as if reshaping itself to the will of the thing that inhabited it. I felt its presence, vast and ancient, a malevolence that transcended the confines of the physical world. It was a hunger, a void that sought to consume, to devour, to spread its darkness into the light. Driven by a madness I could not control, I returned to the door, night after night, compelled by a force beyond my understanding. I studied the symbols, traced the lines with trembling fingers, and felt the power that pulsed beneath the surface. The letters spoke of a ritual, a means to seal the door, to banish the darkness forever, but the words were incomplete, the instructions fragmented. I knew that to attempt the ritual would be to court death, but to do nothing was to accept a fate far worse. The nights grew longer, the shadows deeper, and I felt the pull of the doorway, a compulsion that gnawed at my mind and soul. I was drawn inexorably toward the child, toward the silent beckoning of her outstretched hand, and I knew that soon I would have to answer her call. For in the end, there are some truths too terrible to be denied, some doors that must remain closed, and some horrors that are best left undisturbed. The days passed in a haze of terror and madness, as the weight of my grim revelation settled upon me like a shroud. The doorway had become the very center of my existence, a malevolent presence that overshadowed all else. My mind was consumed with thoughts of the child of the entity, and of the ritual that might save me, or damn me forever. I knew, deep within my soul, that there could be no escape from the darkness that awaited me, for the door had been opened, and the horror beyond could not be so easily banished. On the tenth night, I resolved to end it. Driven by a dread that had transformed into a cold, unyielding resolve, I prepared myself for the ritual. My hands trembled as I gathered the necessary implements, relics of a dark past that had been hidden away in the forgotten corners of the house. Candles, a dagger, and an ancient tome, its pages filled with symbols and incantations that defied comprehension. I laid them out before the door, my heart pounding with a fear that threatened to consume me. The air was thick with the scent of decay, the faint odor of something long dead and buried, now stirred to life. The house groaned and creaked, as if the very timbers were rebelling against my actions. Shadows moved of their own accord, and the whispers, those terrible whispers, filled my ears, a constant murmur that spoke of death and madness. I lit the candles, their flickering flames casting long, twisted shadows upon the walls. The child appeared then, as she always did, her form materializing from the darkness. Her eyes, those voids of despair, met mine, and I felt the weight of her silent plea. She stood beside me, her finger pointing at the door, her presence a reminder of the horror that awaited. She was my guide, my curse, and my only hope. With trembling hands I opened the tome, my eyes scanning the cryptic text, trying to decipher the incantations that would seal the door. The words were in a language not of this world, a tongue that seemed to resonate with the very fabric of reality. As I spoke them aloud, the air grew cold, and the shadows deepened, as if the darkness itself were listening. The doorway pulsed with a sickly light, the symbols glowing with an unholy energy. I felt a pull, a force that seemed to draw me toward the door, as if the entity beyond were reaching out, desperate to cross the threshold. The whispers grew louder, a cacophony of voices that filled my mind, drowning out all thought. I took the dagger, its blade cold and sharp, and drew it across my palm. Blood welled up, dark and crimson, dripping onto the floor. 
I placed my hand upon the door, the blood smearing across the symbols, and spoke the final words of the incantation. The air crackled with energy, and I felt the presence of the entity, vast and terrible, pressing against the door. There was a moment of silence, a brief, terrible stillness, and then the door burst open. The room was filled with a blinding light, a radiance that burned with the fury of a thousand suns. I was thrown back, my body striking the floor with a bone-jarring thud. The light dimmed, and I saw the entity, a being of pure darkness, its form shifting and amorphous, a mass of eyes and mouths that seemed to stretch into infinity. It was a thing of nightmare, a creature not of this world, but of some other reality, a place of madness and chaos. Its eyes fixed upon me, and I felt the weight of its gaze, a pressure that seemed to crush my very soul. The whispers were deafening now, a torrent of voices that filled the room, each one speaking my name. The child stood before the entity, her form small and fragile against the vastness of the creature. Her finger still pointed at the door, and I understood then that she was not pointing at the doorway, but at me. I was the key, the sacrifice that would seal the door, and the entity had come to claim me. Despair filled me, a darkness that swallowed all hope. I knew then that the ritual was a lie, a trap set by the entity to draw me in, to bind me to the doorway forever. The child had not been guiding me to salvation, but to my doom, her silent pointing a command from the entity, a command I had been powerless to resist. I rose to my feet, my body shaking with fear and anger. The entity loomed before me, its eyes fixed upon me, and I felt the pull of its will, a compulsion that drew me toward the door. I knew that to step through would be to embrace oblivion, to surrender my soul to the darkness beyond. But I also knew that there was no other choice. The entity had marked me, claimed me, and there could be no escape. With a scream of defiance, I stepped toward the door, my body moving as if of its own accord. The child's eyes met mine, and I saw in them a flicker of something, sorrow, regret, or perhaps understanding. Her finger pointed at me, and I felt the finality of my fate. I crossed the threshold, and the world dissolved into darkness. The house stands silent now, a relic of a forgotten past, its halls empty, its rooms cold. The villagers speak of it in hushed tones, their eyes averted, for they know the darkness that lies within. The doorway is sealed, the entity banished, but the memory of its presence lingers, a shadow that haunts the very air. The child is gone, her spirit released, her silent pointing no longer needed. But the house remains, a monument to the darkness that once dwelled within. The doorway is closed, but the horror is not forgotten, for there are some truths too terrible to be denied, some doors that must remain closed, and some horrors that are best left undisturbed.